Christmas only comes once a year. Why not? Why not? Yeah, well, how much? I'll knock off two bucks because I can see you're a man who knows his trees. This isn't one of those trees that all the needles falls off, is it? No, that's impossible. The old man loved bargaining as much as an Arab trader, and he was twice as shrewd. You know, Zudok just found one of those brand new green plastic trees. <gasps> Darn thing looks like it's made out of green pipe cleaners. <laughs> Throw us some rope and tie it in your car for you. You got a team. Deal. It's not Christmas in June. We don't live in northern Indiana. No one, thankfully, is going to stick his tongue to a freezing metal pole. And you're not stuck in the middle of a Christmas story marathon, thank goodness. But in this clip, we see someone who's become a modern-day icon and really sort of a symbol of Americana, Ralphie, this mythological boy who is more real than we probably give him credit for, living within some incredible family dynamics that seem somehow to keep us mesmerized for 24 hours every Christmas Eve on TBS. Are any of you like Ralphie's father? Or have any of you had a parent like Ralphie's father, always ready to uh, strike a deal with someone, no matter the cost or the product. And going into our message today, you may think, well, I'm basing this on Broadway, but you would be wrong. <laughs> um, will you join your hearts in prayer with me? God, I pray that your spirit will be among us today, and we will hear your word proclaimed that... Um, that our lives might be changed, that we might be transformed, and that we might be inspired to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I remember observing the, the sales do -si do between my father and car salesman through the years. And yes, I know there are some of you in sales here, so thank you for your service. <laughs> But I told my dad I was going to tell this today just because uh, in, in thinking through this scripture passage, it seemed to be a, a different way to look at it. But <clears throat> I'm going to kind of act it out a little bit for you today about the dance between my dad and those car salesmen. And you'll have to forgive me if the uh, car salesman sounds a little like George W. Bush. I'm, I'm going for an East Tennessee accent here. Mr. Henry... Let's get down to business. This car is listed at, you know, X number of dollars. Yeah, well, I, I can't do that. Well, what can you do? Well, I can't do that. It'd have to be a bit less. Tony, what would it take to get you in this car today? And notice at this point, my dad hasn't mentioned a number at all. And I, one thing I've learned from my dad is wait as long as you can before you put that number in there. Well, I could, I could probably do about $5,000 less than you're asking. Well, I can't do that. Well, then what can you do? I tell you what, you've got a beautiful family, and I can tell you're a good Christian man. I'll knock $1,000 off the price right now. Well, I can't do that. It's going to have to be less. Hmm, well, since you've been such a loyal customer, I'll knock another $500 off. I'll give you $4,500 less for it. Tony, can we meet in the middle? You've got to help me out here. Come on, throw me a bone. Okay, $3,500 less. Well, I know you can do $3,500 less. I've seen the blue book. Oh, so you, you come down here with the blue book in your pocket? Yep, I've done my homework. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll try to make it $3,500 off, but I need to go talk to my manager. Okay, we'll wait here. A few minutes pass, and the salesman returns. Okay, now, my manager said it's okay, but only in this instance, and we need to shake on it and have you sign the paperwork before you leave today. Once you walk out that door, the offer's no good. Well, there's one more thing. What now, Mr. Henry? What was it? You remember? I told you he'd get it. I need you to throw in the maintenance manual. I 
let me go talk to my manager. And that's how the whole thing went. And let me tell you, you'd have thought that the maintenance manual would have screwed up the whole deal. But he always got it. Every single time, he got the maintenance manual. Now, I'm not certain if you've thought of this before, but I want you to think from the salesman's perspective. And I want you to think, how many of you would want Jesus selling your products? It might seem like a great idea considering he's the Savior and all. Jesus was perfect. Think of the manager making the hire. I bet he'd be a dynamite salesperson, and he'd bring a lot of moral integrity to our team as well. What do you think? you think Jesus is ready for sales? I tend to think not. I think Jesus would be a horrible salesperson. Why? Here are the conversations. Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. We'll get ready to be homeless. Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Well, let's go then. What, you mean now? Well, yeah, when were you thinking? I haven't given notice yet. Sure you have. You just told me. Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Come on, I'm headed out. Well, my husband will be home in a minute. I, I got to wait until he gets home. I don't have a minute. I'm headed to Jerusalem. But j have you ever been to Jerusalem? I didn't think so. I'm going. What a downer. The one who became our grace wasn't even willing to give any. There was no bargaining with Jesus. And even at this point, his eyes were fixed upon Jerusalem. And he cast aside the rejection he faced in Samaria because he knew that rejection is a part of discipleship. It is the way that leads to the cross. This wouldn't be the last time Jesus was rejected. He was holding all the face cards and there was no bargaining with him. He knew what following him would take. In our conference, we're being led into new directions of intentional discipleship. And we've been challenged by our new bishop, Bishop Bill McAlilly, who was with us here for the consecration, if you remember, of consecration of our new sanctuary. But we've been challenged by Bishop McAlilly and the conference leadership to answer the question, who is our neighbor? This fits great into the VBS theme from this week. Who is our neighbor? Well, it seems like an easy enough question to answer, right? That our neighbors are the people that we meet every day. Okay, so how do we reach out to them? Now, I don't know about you, but I've kind of found this amazing that we're asking ourselves challenging questions about how we talk to people. Our society has changed. It's become a place where it's difficult to make connections with people. People are so inwardly focused. Have you noticed that? We look at our smartphones, we look at our TVs, and everything we need is quick. Everything we need is right where we need it, right when we need it. But it's a legitimate question for us to ask. How do we reach out to them? But before we answer that question, we must first answer the question, why do this in the first place? When we asked ourselves that as a conference leadership meeting recently, we couldn't even answer the question. I mean, ultimately, yes, the question is, because Jesus came for us, because Jesus gave his life, and Jesus defeated sin and death for us. That, that's the why. Jesus came for the whole world. That's the why. But for us, why do we do this? Our own personal reasons. Why do we do this? It's an appropriate question to ask when we live in a world where people believe they don't have a reason to need Christ. The temptation is strong for all of us to fill our lives with so much extra stuff that simply doesn't matter. Culture tells us it matters. TV tells us it matters. Our smartphones tell us it matters. Even our friends tell us it matters. But Jesus tells us it doesn't matter. What matters is a relationship with Jesus Christ. What matters is salvation. And what matters is discipleship. Salvation itself is such an interesting word when you look at it this way. When we consider what we are being saved from. Our own culture has isolated us from survival. And I'm not complaining, but in many ways, we've been isolated from survival. Death is no longer an everyday event when seen through what seems to be the myopic lens 
of our immediate surroundings. We become very short-sighted, very nearsighted. So we are forced to be in mission to other cultures and not to our own. Have you noticed that Christianity burns like wildfire in places where death has many opportunities to be victorious? Cultures stuck in the throes of suffering have a need for Jesus that we often don't. Even in our travels to Matamoros with the work of Bless the Children and the work of our district, we've seen suffering. We've seen places that we can't imagine here in this country. But they have a need for Jesus that we often don't. And we're at a serious disadvantage. I want you to hear me say this. I believe we're at a serious disadvantage here in the Bible Belt. Here in the place where oftentimes the moral compass of our country hinges, we're at a serious disadvantage. There is an expectation here to have a relationship with Jesus Christ that we assume everyone does. Our faith is such a visible everyday thing that we often overlook it and take it for granted. But we mustn't be haughty enough to think that we've risen above death because we aren't starving or because we don't live in a community racked with AIDS or because we don't have landmines in our own backyard. We need Jesus now more than ever to save us from indifference resulting from our own comfort. We could be li living, we could be living in a post-survivalist era here in our country, but there are many in our own backyard who are not. So here we are in a community struggling with survival that oftentimes we don't see, and we're trying to find ways to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with our neighbors. Sometimes you, you think it makes us feel like salespeople. I've often heard it said that our job as ministers is to be in sales and that what we're selling is salvation. I don't like this metaphor at all. Look at Jesus. In addition to being our Savior, He's also the center of our life of discipleship. But based on this scripture that we've heard today, I think He was a horrible salesman. There's a rhythm to sales, a back and forth, a collegiality that Jesus either didn't understand, but I have a feeling more so he refused to embody. We're not selling salvation, friends. We might offer Christ to people, but salvation is God's work. There's a cost, but that cost is between God and the recipient of God's grace, and there isn't a, necessarily a bargaining process. Based on the narrative today, would you follow Jesus? Yes, I'll follow you, but first let me go and bury my father. Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. But, but whoa, whoa, Jesus, this is my family. This story doesn't make it very appealing to follow Christ, but it does show the cost of discipleship. Jesus requires our all. It's hard for us to see it today because we're not struggling to survive. But Jesus demands our all. The one thing I want to leave you with today. Jesus may have scored low on a sales exam, but he saved my life. Has he saved yours? Are you living like he saved yours? Jesus saved me from pride and self-righteousness. I've had a lot of that. I've lived through a lot of that in my life. But what has he saved you from? Are you free? This is such a time in our country where we talk about freedom and we talk about breaking the bonds that have kept us. But really, are you free? Because there are times when it doesn't matter necessarily what our country is doing. And people struggle with their own freedom, being liberated from sin and from death. So what has he saved you from? In the words of Thomas Jefferson, the one who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time. You are free to follow Christ. But don't be surprised when he asks you to do something you're not willing to do. He's a horrible salesperson because there is no way he's going to accept a lesser offer. He lived for you. 
He died for you. He rose for you. And he lives today for you and for the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.